Welcome to Ash Wednesday, friends. My name's Ron Schultz. I'm the interim minister at Union, the church at Chelsea Park. We're a United Methodist congregation in Chelsea, Alabama, and we're delighted that you can join us for this Ash Wednesday celebration. We've had some inclement weather moving through our area, and so we're not able to meet in person this evening for our planned uh, worship service. But we're so glad to have this technology so that you and everyone else can join us for this time of worship. One of the readings for this evening comes from the book of Joel, the second chapter, beginning the reading with verse 12. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with sorrow. Tear your hearts, not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, very patient, full of faithful love, and ready to forgive. I'm glad you've joined us this evening for this time of worship and forgiveness. Join me as we pray. Give us now, Lord, eyes which are open to our own sin. Give us a conscience which is sensitive and quick to warn. Please give us a heart that cannot sin in peace but is moved to regret and remorse and repentance. So grant that being truly repentant, we may be truly forgiven so that we may find that your love is great enough to cover all our sin through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The gospel reading for this service comes from Matthew's gospel chapter 6. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, Put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others but by your Father who is in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's Ash Wednesday. We're not able to be physically together, but we're able to join our hearts and our minds together 
as we're gathered by God's word and by God's spirit, as we come together to worship, to enter into a season of Lent, 40 days. We're not able to share physically ashes with each other. You may or may not have ashes close at hand with which to mark the sign of the cross on your forehead or on your hand. But you can remember the cross of Jesus as we worship together this evening. You can make the sign of the cross with or without ashes on your forehead or on your hand or across your heart. You can remember the great love and sacrifice that God has given through Jesus Christ that we might know life and know it fully and know it eternally. It's Ash Wednesday, and Ash Wednesday is the time when we get to learn one more time the great scandal at the heart of the Christian faith. The great scandal at the heart of the Christian faith is simply this, and eternally this, and mysteriously this. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. Only sinners. Most of the time, we go to great lengths to tell ourselves that we're rather nice people. We're good folks for the most part. We may not be the best people in the world, we say, but we're certainly not the worst. And then if we're pressed, we can come up with a list of people who might be considered far worse than we are when it comes to being bad, when it comes to being sinners. As United Methodists, we talk about our spiritual growth. We like to say that we're moving on to perfection. We like to say, well, I'm better than I once was. I'm not as good as I'm going to be, but I'm better than I was. You see, I'm moving on toward perfection. We're working hard. We're improving ourselves by ourselves. We're lifting ourselves up out of the muck and the mire of what once was called sin. We're not as bad as we used to be. We spend a lot of time and a lot of effort trying to convince ourselves of those very statements. And given the opportunity, we try to convince other people as well. But now, today, the church comes along with a cup full of ashes to smear on our bodies, forcing us to our knees in confession, teaching us to say, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy upon me a sinner. As she was going out the church, she said, I am so glad that Ash Wednesday is almost here. I'm glad that we get to celebrate Ash Wednesday. That caught my attention, and I said, you're glad for Ash Wednesday? Most people always think it's such a, such a morbid service. It's hard to get people to come out to an Ash Wednesday service to consider our sin. And she said, well, I'm glad there's going to be an Ash Wednesday service. You don't know me that well, but I was the victim of sexual abuse by a relative when I was a young teenager. I spent years in therapy trying to get over it. I went from church to church. I was deep into pop spirituality, feel-good religion. I listened to all the radio worship services and tuned in to all the TV services. I was into a feel-good religion. 
but they weren't really any help to me at the end of the day, she said. That's why I'm glad we're coming to that time of year when the church celebrates Ash Wednesday, when the church makes us put all of the injustice, all of the sin, all of the blood, all of the guilt of the world on the altar and forces us to look at it and let God deal with it. I understood what she meant. So in that vein, in that vein, I think it's possible in a service of Ash Wednesday to rejoice and be happy. Tonight begins the season of Lent. Today, the poor, old, incompetent church courageously reminds us that sin is God's business. It reminds us of the joy of letting go of our illusions about ourselves and giving them over to God. And so for the next 40 days, we get to examine our very own lives. We don't have to exert our energy looking across the political aisle and pointing out the faults of those who sit on the other side of the aisle. We don't have to spend the next 40 days pointing out the sins of others. We don't have to point out the sins and shortcomings of the conservatives or the progressives or the liberals or the middle-of-the-road moderates. We don't have to do any of that. For the next 40 days, we get to examine our own life and our own sin and our own shortcomings. We won't be holding our lives up trying to impress God. And we won't be holding our lives up to a God whose standards are too high to attain. In these 40 days, the posture of our heart will be to bow before God who loves us and in the light of Jesus Christ forgives the very worst within us. If you think about it, only Christians know the joy of a God who forgives. Knowing the grace of a God who forgives we can be truly honest about our sin. If we know in our heart of hearts that God is a God of love and forgiveness, we can open our heart and in faith and confidence trust God to hear the very worst of our sins. So I invite you I invite you tonight and I invite you in these 40 days to sit quietly and dare to root around into the headlines of the news. And if you really want to be bold, consider your own selfish, cheating, sinful little heart. I want to warn you to beware. If you do what I'm suggesting, you're liable to be overwhelmed with guilt and shame. The deeper you open your heart and the closer you examine your sin, the more susceptible you are to guilt and shame. A deep, honest look at yourself leads to only one viable option as far as we humans are concerned, and that option is self-deceit. We end up in front of our guilt and shame, stepping back aghast and saying, well, 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 I'm not that bad. 
I'm not that bad. I can think of somebody else who's worse. Self-deceit. On Ash Wednesday, Christians give thanks that Christ came to save sinners. Only sinners. Because in Christ, we know that God loves us and forgives us and embraces us sinners. And that, that, my friends, leads us into a happy limb. And so now, whether you have actual ashes to place upon your body, or whether you're going to just impose the sign of the cross on your body somewhere, I invite you to join me as I pray. Jesus, come and save us. We are but dust. We are like ashes. We are sinners. But you can touch and heal our souls. Jesus, come and forgive us. Our hearts are heavy. Our burdens are great. Jesus, come and heal us. Restore our sight. Mend our hearts. Teach us truth. Speak to us words that bring us wholeness. Lord, we lay our sin before you and we rejoice in your love and mercy. Amen. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Christ died for sinners, only sinners. Repent and believe and rejoice in the good news. And now, go knowing that God is almighty and merciful. God does not desire the death of sinners. God desires that we turn from our sin and live. God accepts your repentance. God forgives your sins. And God restores you by the Holy Spirit to newness of life. And God will lead you into a happy land. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.